two thumbs up for my two friends. We got thumbs up. And Jason. Two and thumbs thumb. Okay. And let's yeah, do this, guys. Let's go. All right, let's go. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do this. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, my name is Sean. Uh, this is Ray. This is Connor. Uh, we are Plugin Tradition. Uh, yeah, Plugin Tradition is a live lit show about music. Um, you know, we write and present essays that typically focus on like broader, you know, themes in pop music, like movie soundtracks, queer artists, dad rock, like alt rock radio. Um, we typically tell personal stories that you know demonstrate how this music has affected our lives. Uh, tonight, though, we need to talk about something bigger than that, um, something bigger than all of us. Uh, tonight, we'd like to talk to you about. <laughs> now, granted, we only have 20 minutes, we can't really delve into his entire universe or multiple universes that Prince has created, but we thought we'd give you a primer on the purple one. So, ladies and gentlemen, Collector's Edition presents everything you need to know about Prince in 20 minutes. Sean, begin! Okay, so uh, let's start with the basics. So, Prince was born Prince Rogers Nelson on June 7th, 1958. Uh, it is not a stage name. Uh, Prince is his actual birth name. There he is with his afro. Uh, his nickname as a kid was Skipper, uh, which sadly never factored into the numerous other stage names he adopted later on in his career. Prince fun fact number 14. Other Prince pseudonyms he used. Jamie Starr, Christopher, Alexander Nevermind, <laughs> Joey Coco, Spooky Electric, Bob George, Camille, and Tora Tora. <laughs> Seven, uh, he composed his first song, it was called Funk Machine, and this is despite the fact that it was 1965, and I'm pretty sure funk wasn't really a genre yet, so that is the power of young uh, uh, And it's also worth mentioning, uh, he did play basketball in high school, so we're all free to pretend that Dave Chappelle Prince sketch was entirely 100% fact. Prince fact, number 20, Prince claims that Dave, Ch uh, Dave Chappelle sketch where he beats Charlie Murphy at basketball is mostly true, except for the bluffs. You were the bluffs, you were, yeah. Uh, at a young age, Prince developed a proficiency with every single instrument that was handed to him. The dude was a, a super genius. Uh, after moonlighting in some bands and producing some demos, he, he found a, uh, he landed a recording contract with Warner Brothers Records that allowed him full creative control over his first three albums. Uh, his first two, uh, he took total advantage of that control. Uh, his first two albums, For You and Prince, uh, were released in 1978 and 1979 respectively, and he played every single instrument on those albums himself. Uh, now those two albums are not commonly celebrated by Prince enthusiasts, so they're kind of light, enjoyable R&B albums, he's shirtless, uh, he's a bright 20 year old young man who clearly knows what he's doing with his chest. Uh, this incarnation of Prince, he was a romantic at heart, you know, uh, he had a song called The Baby and he, and he sang, should we go on living together or should we get married right away? Whatever you decide. I'll still love you, baby, and we'll grow stronger every day. Those are Prince lyrics. Um, not to mention lines like, I hope our baby has eyes just like yours. That is right, folks. At age 20, this man was more ready, was more than ready to settle down, get married, and have a four-wheel child. Uh, now, <laughs> that sounds out of character for the Prince we all know and love, but never you mind, never you worry. Uh, the seeds of bizarro, sexy, modern, darling Nicky Prince were right there from the beginning. Uh, you can hear it on uh, the song Bambi uh, from his uh, self-titled second album. Uh, there's a, it's a song where Prince tries to convince a lesbian to have sex with him. Uh, I quote, Bambi, can't you understand? Bambi, it's better with a man. <laughs> to further his points, <laughs> come on, baby, take me by the hand. I'm going to show you what it's like to be loved by a man. <laughs> oh, golly. Uh, in retrospect, it should have come as a surprise to nobody when he released his third album, Dirty Mind. Uh, this oh, is the oh, oh, yeah, 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 here we go, here we go. This is the one that made Prince Prince, okay? This is, uh, not only did he start throwing new wave and hard rock and funk into his finely brewed R&B stew, but he started writing about sex in ways that would eventually force Tipper Gore to awkwardly explain masturbation to her 14-year-old daughter. Uh, there's a song called Head, uh, where he, uh, he lures a young bride away from her wedding on her wedding day, uh, so he can go down on her. Uh, there's a song called Sister, where Prince Details having sex with his 32-year-old sister at age 16. Prince fun fact number 29. Prince's first keyboardist, Gail Chapman, left the band because of her religious beliefs, claiming she was uncomfortable playing the song Head, as well as being French kissed by Prince. <laughs> 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 okay. Everyone, it's okay. Everyone, it's okay. Alright. Prince, he never actually had an older sister. He was just having fun with his mind, with his creepy, uncomfortable mind. Um, on the flip side, uh, this is also when Prince started incorporating like, religion and politics into his songs. He has a song called Party Up, and it has this uh, lyric, You're gonna have to fight your own damn war, because we don't want to fight no more. 
uh, which is great. On his next album, Controversy, he has a song called uh, Ronnie Talks to Russia. Uh, he speaks directly to President Ronald Reagan with the following message. Ronnie, talk to Russia before it's too late, before they blow up the world. Uh, did Ronnie listen to Prince's message? You tell me. <laughs> From then on, uh, we get to the Prince we all know, and I, I, could, I don't know what I, I can tell you about 80s Prince that you don't already know. So let's, let's, just, let's just get through this, or let's sum it up. Albums, 1999, Purple Rain, Around the World in the Day, Parade, Sign of the Times, yeah. Love Sexy, Batman Soundtrack. All right, yeah. singles, you want singles? Okay, fine, let's do it. 1999, Little Red Corvette, Let's Go Crazy, When Doves Cry, Take Me With You, Raspberry Parade, Kiss. Sign of the Times, you got the look, Alphabet Street, that dance, alright, alright? This guy wrecks the A's, this guy wrecks the A's with funk, and rock, and sex, and purple! Now, we could dig deep into each and every one of these classics, but we don't want to tread on, on well-worn territory. Instead, we're going to talk about the one Prince song that truly matters, that will define his career until the end of time. And it is track three on the 1987 album, Sign of the Times. Housequake. Yeah! Can we play a little Housequake, please? Shut up! Oh, man. <laughs> Alright, so I have the question for everyone here. Definitely. Who here knows the song Housequake? Yeah. Woo! No, really? Really? If anyone here is from the song Housequake, say yeah. 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 If you know one like the song Housequake, say oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> you went hip to the real Housequake! Song of all time. Uh, I'll give you the song that asks if you know what Hellsquake is, then commands you to dance for not knowing. As of this show, it has been listened to 107,291 times by 35,526 people, and last episode, I'm just like, about the song Seattle with the editor Michael Angelo called it a funny dance song in which Prince sounds like he's singing through his nose. That is not nearly an enthusiastic enough response. He should be embarrassed. Yeah. Embarrassed. Hey guys. Question. Yeah. Does anybody know about the quake? <laughs> Bullshit! Ladies and gentlemen, the crap of musical history, pre and post house quake! Thank you. The album version of House Quake runs at 4 minutes and 42 seconds. Inferior only to the 7 minutes Mo Quake extended cut, which runs at a clean 7 minutes and 10 seconds. It is by definition the superior version of House Quake because it is more House Quake. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Did you have more? Oh, no, it's okay. Uh, this song will be played at Connor Sullivan's funeral. <laughs> this song will be played at Rick Joyce's funeral. This song will be played at Charles's funeral. You guys! Oh my god. Wait, takes you to the grave. Oh, no. <laughs> um. Uh, 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 god damn it, turn, turn it up. Listen to this fucking song. This mother there. Come on! Come on, you guys. Come on. Come on. Come on. As soon as the 90s rolled in, Prince's career tailspin into this disastrous spiral of label conflicts and rap solos and multiple triple albums and Oprah interviews. Um, the 90s changed Prince's image from an eccentric, untouchable living masterpiece to that of a volatile, occasional genius. Very different. Um, how did this happen? Uh, well, the very first thing that Prince did in the 90s was instantly ruin his movie career by releasing a terrible sequel to Purple Rain. It's called Rufi Bridge. Prince, fun fact number eight. Prince joined Sylvester Stallone, Roberto Benigni, Kevin Costner, William Shatner, and Tom Green as being the only actors to direct themselves in performances that would win them a Razzie Award for Worst Actor. Thanks, Connor. Uh, so, Rufi Bridge. Prince fact number 13. He was also nominated for the Worst New Star and Worst Actor of the Decade at the 1990 Razzie Awards. Uh -huh. and. Worst actor of the century. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. That's very Prince true. Prince Funback number 77. Prince still considers Graffiti Bridge a success. <laughs> At one time saying it was non-violent, positive, and had no blatant sex scenes. <laughs> Maybe it will take people 30 years to get it. They trashed the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> 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 
I'm screening after the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so after that, he decided to give rap music a shot. And his next album, Diamonds and Pearls, and that didn't work out either. Uh, the Love Symbol album only saw a slightly better reception, so the 90s were off to a pretty rocky start for Prince. Uh, but things really start to derail in 1993 when he changed his name to this. Okay, everyone knows the symbol. You all know. You're all here to learn. I don't need to tell you that he changed his name to an unpronounceable symbol. Um, but if you take a closer look, there's a lot going on here. This captures a lot about what makes Prince Prince. You know, it's a model of the Mars and Venus gender symbols expressing Prince's potent sexuality. Um, it's kind of shameful. I'll say it again. Um, it's kind of similar to a cross, you know, kind of like expressing his, you know, strong religious beliefs. Uh, but what's really noteworthy about this symbol to me, what's most important, is that it's super annoying. <laughs> super annoying. The love symbol wasn't really about expressing himself, like he said, because when has Prince ever had trouble doing that? Like, a, a, less than a year before he released that tattoo, um, he released a single called My Name is Prince. And this is the cover. It's called My Name is Prince. He's holding a microphone gun. <laughs> That's pretty symbolic. I don't know. He was doing just fine. He wasn't fooling anyone. Um, you know, Prince spent most of the 90s as like a major label irritant, blaming Warner Brothers for trying to stifle his creativity and not properly promoting his awesome rap albums, uh, trying to break away from his contract with Warner Brothers. Uh, Prince fact number six, in order to use the unpronounceable Prince love symbol uh, in print media, Warner Brothers had to organize a mass mailing of floppy disks with a custom file. 1990s. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the symbol is just a way to make him that much harder to market, part of a series of efforts to get dropped from his contract. Uh, Prince would write the word slave on his face before performances yeah. to make a point. Um, he released compilations and intentionally boring albums to fulfill his contract. Um, actually, the album he released right after changing his name to a symbol wasn't credited to the symbol. It was uh, his worst album, Calm, it's terrible. Uh, it's credited to Prince 1958 to 1993 to symbolize his creative death and rebirth. <laughs> it was getting pretty bad, you guys. Um, for a while, it looked like the last great Prince album would be Batman. Uh, but look, by this time, most everyone except Prince diehard fans had given up on him. You know, he'd spent the early 90s chasing trends or dealing with major label nonsense, so people were too tired to dig through and come to the good stuff. Uh, but this is why Prince is great. You know, Prince changes in one direction, he never looks back. You know, the guy who sampled AOL floppy disks in 1996 has since turned his back on the internet completely. He said he's dead? I don't know. Um, he lost the child whose heartbeat he samples unless of a baby, and he never tried to be a father again. Uh, Prince has never tried to make another dirty mind or sign of the times. He's stubbornly refused to make anything except for the music that he wants to make, even if he just wants to make music to piss off his record label or his fans or his bandmates, I don't know. Um, <laughs> the only thing Prince has ever returned to is his name. Um, as soon as the 90s were over, Prince gave up on the symbol and told everyone he could start calling him Prince again. <laughs> Alright folks, I want to talk to you a little bit about modern Prince. Uh, at the beginning of the 21st century, uh, Prince made a very unsexy move and he became a devout Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. Uh, so if you were coming to a print show looking to hear Get Off or Jack You Off or Sexy Motherfucker, uh, you're probably going to get a harsh tongue scolding instead. Um, now, uh, there have been stories of Prince going from house to house in Minnesota, uh, trying to convert people to his faith. So I thought it would be really crazy if uh, you were like a junior in high school by Lake Minnetonka and you finally lost your virginity and then knock on the door and there's Prince in like a saintly purple robe <laughs> telling you there are better ways to live your life. <laughs> like your head would explode. Um, in 2004, Prince began his decade-long comeback tour uh, and he uh, appeared on the Grammys with Beyonce. Uh, this appearance reminded everybody that he was fucking Prince and they all need to love the shit out of him while they fucking can. Uh, so that was good. And then that same year, he released an album called Musicology, which was actually pretty good. Uh, Prince uh, fact number 26. Uh, Musicology was Prince's best selling album in years. Uh, but this is mostly due to concert goers receiving a copy of the album with every ticket they purchased. Uh, this prompted Billboard magazine and Nielsen Sounds to change its dark yet uh, methodology. That's right. Uh, uh, but Musicology is great, but it's a little tame uh, because uh, the 21st century brought us uh, a Prince that I like to call Domesticated Prince. See, Prince got married in 2001 when he became a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, the songs in this album, its follow-up, the wonderful 3121, uh, shows a man in crisis. Prince is still all about fucking. Don't forget that. But he's only about fucking his wife. Now, uh, there's a song called Black Sweat. He says, don't want to turn nobody on unless it's you. 
And there's a song called Lolita where he rebuffs the advances of an underage girl. Because Lolita ain't gonna make a cheetah out of Prince. <laughs> <laughs> but it's no use. All of his constant fuck energy has his wife bored. There's a slow jam called Satisfied where he has to plead his wife to turn off her cell phone before they have sex. He literally says, turn off your mobile device before we get to ramen. Like, this is the first time Prince has faced this dilemma, where it's a woman tired of his princely antics. Uh, on Musicology, there's a song called On the Couch. Uh, in the 80s, a song called On the Couch would mean Prince is fucking somebody on a couch. In 2004, he was making his wife upset because he wanted to watch the movie Love Jones, and she's making him sleep on the couch instead. Like, a woman kicking Prince out of bed, this has never fucking happened! So to give you an idea, it can't be married easy to be married to someone like Prince, I and mean, he's devoted to his faith, and also to fucking you, under the name of the sacrament of matrimony. But, I mean, I'm sure he's great at fucking you, but, like, <laughs> is he gonna show up to your nephew's christening? <laughs> like, you know, that's, that's the question that I ask, so to give you an idea of what marriage to Prince is like, I've created a roleplay scenario. I will be playing the role of Prince's wife, Manuela Testolini, <laughs> and uh, Sean will be doing the honor of playing the purple one. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> yes, applause. We take, we take you now to Paisley Park. Prince, did you get my dry cleaning this afternoon? <laughs> Prince, you know I needed my dress for my book club meeting. Oh, now I'm going to be out with my dress. I can't get it till Monday. Thanks a lot. Did you at least take the pot roast out of the oven? Prince, now what am I going to feed the book club? Oh, sometimes you're useless. I don't even know why I even put up with you sometimes. Prince. No, no. No hour-long love sessions for you, young man. It's time for you to sleep on the couch. What do you say to that? So that was about six years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thanks, everyone. Now, we can see in that well-acted scenario that Prince clearly loves his wife, but he's got a one-track mind. Uh, you felt that as his marriage fell apart, the only way he could save it was through the power of his holy dick. Uh, and, uh, he was wrong. <laughs> Maybe for the only time in his life. I think every other time it's worked. I mean, that's Carmen Electra. Uh, she was a protege in the 80s. Her name was Cat. No, uh, it's not. It's not? Oh, you can't. Other protege. Other protege. There's, there's 87 Prince protégés, but you don't have time for them. Uh, in the last few years, Prince has made forgettable albums, forgettable protégés. He hasn't said fuck in a long time. Uh, I think that's also because he also claims to be celibate now, which is weird and maybe part of the problem. Maybe that's why the albums are un you know, forgettable now. I urge any attractive woman in this audience, uh, be it a cinnamon girl, a uh, hot thing, perhaps a lady cab driver, <laughs> they're all Prince songs, I urge you to go to Paisley Park, knock on that little door, because he's a little man, <laughs> let him open that door, and you give him one long, hot fuck sesh that I don't think the Prince creativity genes, because I will thank you, Sean will thank you, Rick will thank you, more importantly, the entire world will thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got a few more Prince tests we need to get out of the yeah, way real quick. Yeah, the following song is Shockadelica. Shockadelica. Every room of Prince's home is wired for sound so you can record music from any room in his house, including the bathroom. <laughs> Prince opened for the Rolling Stones in 1981 and was reportedly booed off the stage with angry audience members pelting him with garbage. When asked about the incident, he said, I'm sure if anyone were wearing underwear in a trench coat didn't help matters, but if you throw trash at anybody, it's because you weren't trained right at home. Uh, Prince is now on Twitter, and this is his first selfie. <laughs> Prince is the only musical guest in Muppet history to perform a never-before-heard song on the show. It's called She Gave Her Angels, and it's absolutely Prince once banned a Foo Fighters cover of Darling Nikki, then proceeded to give the ultimate middle finger and cover one of their songs during the Super Bowl halftime show. Uh, uh, for all three Morris Day and the Time albums released in the 80s, Prince played every single instrument himself, despite the band being credited on the cover. Uh, so this is the cover of the second Time album. It's Morris Day checking his watch. Look at this! Holy shit! He's in a room full of clocks and he's checking his watch! Prince was convinced that Rick James was out to kill him. <laughs> 
Uh, b -b 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 uh, Prince was chosen as the world's sexiest vegetarian in Peter's annual online poll. Uh, Prince is the one of the only artists who denied Weird Al Yankovic permission to parody his songs. Uh, the most that we're going to get out of Prince was permission to parody one single scene from the Windows. Prince claims he was born epileptic and used to have seizures as a kid. According to his mom, one day he told her, Mom, I'm not going to be sick anymore. When she asked why, he said, because an angel told me so. <laughs> uh, Prince apparently used to visit strip clubs and would offer dancers double their night's salary to stop working. Uh, uh, Prince's original name for the band Vanity Six was reportedly Vagina and the <laughs> This is the cover art for Prince's new single. <laughs> He's also removed any videos that are using his songs without permission, including a clip of her mo of a mother filming her infant daughter dancing to Let's Go Crazy that had 28 views. Uh, uh, several Prince songs have Spanish titles or feature women performing spoken word sections in Spanish. Prince does not know Spanish. Ah. Rick saw Prince play in 2004 on the Musicology Tour, and he gets a little quiet and misty when you ask him about it. Uh, Connor saw Prince play the United Center last year. Uh, he played for three hours and did six encores, and according to Connor, it was the best. He played Party Man! Sean didn't know that Prince was a good dancer until last night. I, I had no idea. Is that I think? Uh, uh, is it me? Tell them everything about Prince. Is that, uh, that's it? Yeah. Oh, what was that? Aftershock! Okay!